so we're going to get started, guys. Um, we have Dr. Rajani Sebastian presenting today from Johns Hopkins University, and she is a postdoctoral fellow and speech language pathologist working with Dr. R.G. Hillis. And she's done some transcranial direct current stimulation work in the past, and today is going to talk to us particularly about cerebellar TDCS uh, augmenting <laughs> aphasia treatment. So whenever you're ready, Dr. Sebastian, go ahead. Okay, well, thank you, Bree, and um, thank you to all the C-STAR uh, PIs for inviting me to give this talk. So um, I will share some data with you today about my project on um, cerebellar TDCS. Um, so I'm going to talk about two different studies, and uh, feel free to stop me in between if you have any questions. And uh, if I can't hear you, maybe you can actually type the question, and it's going to pop up on my screen. So, OK. So we all know that aphasia is one of the leading causes of disability following stroke. And individuals with post-stroke aphasia are left with some degree of uh, chronic deficit for which current um, treatments are variably effective. So a small but growing body of evidence um, indicates that TDCS may be useful for enhancing the effects of behavioral aphasia treatment. So TDCS studies of aphasia uh, vary in their design as well as the regions that are targeted for stimulation. Um, so many researchers have targeted um, left hemisphere regions to facilitate activity in the residual left hemisphere language um, regions. So uh, what they do is they do anodal left hemisphere stimulation to the perilesional or ipsilesional um, region. And then the cathodal or the reference is um, typically placed on the forehead, uh, the cheek, or the shoulder. Now other researchers have targeted uh, the right hemisphere to inhibit or downregulate the activity of the right hemisphere. So they usually target do cathodal right hemisphere stimulation to the homologs of Broca's or Wernicke's area. And recently, a few research group of researchers have started doing bilateral TDCS montages. And so they simultaneously simultaneously facilitate the right left hemisphere and downregulate or inhibit activity in the right hemisphere. And so the whole idea is that doing simultaneous facilitation and simultaneous inhibition might um, you know, foster language improvement in aphasia. Um, however, inhibition of right hemisphere um, regions might have detrimental effects on cognitive functions that normally rely on um, right hemisphere functions. So it still remains unclear which brain region should be stimulated um, to optimize effects on language recovery. Um, so there is a somewhat um, ongoing consensus that you know, we should uh, probably stimulate left hemisphere regions and do anodal stimulation. However, this becomes um, slightly tricky when you have patients with very large um, left hemisphere stroke. So large left hemisphere stroke impedes improvement of language functions that are dependent on left hemisphere network. So what I'm doing is proposing a new approach to augment language skills in patients with chronic aphasia by stimulating the right cerebellum. So the cerebellum, uh, for a very long time, people thought it was just involved in motor functions. And for, I don't know, for, hundred, you know, for several decades, people just ignored the cognitive aspects of the right, cere um, of the right cerebellum. So it's, I think, somewhere in the 80s that researchers started noticing that um, you know, cognitive impairment happened after stroke or tumor, and then they started doing research to find out more about the involvement of right cerebellum in language functions. Um, so there's been an increasing number of studies that have focused on looking at the cognitive and language contributions of the right cerebellum um, after you know, stroke or any other um, disease or even in normal healthy controls. So one of the most um, interesting aspects of the right cerebellum is that it holds the highest concentration of neurons of the brain. Um, although the entire cerebellum represents 10% of brain volume, 
it likely contains more than 80% of neurons and um, you know much way more than what you see in the cerebral cortex and as TDCS mainly acts on the neurons and given the anatomical organization of the cerebellum immediately below the skull TDCS is particularly interesting for an effective um, neuromodulation of um, cerebellar circuits. So I want to briefly talk to you a little bit about the cerebro-cerebellar circuit so you can understand a little bit more about the effects of um, cerebellar TDCS. So um, the cerebellum is massively um, interconnected with the cortex and um, neuroanatomical studies have shown bidirectional pathways between the cerebellum and the cortex. However, these pathways are not direct. Um, it's polysynaptic. So this um, diagram on the left actually shows you the main input and output pathways from the cerebellum to the cerebellar cortex. So um, input projections from the cortex um, first synapse onto the pons which then crosses over to the contralateral cerebellum. And then output projections from the um, cerebellum go to the dentate, which then um, cross over to the contralateral thalamus, which then project to the cortex. Now, um, in general, uh, when you do cerebellar TDCS, anodal cerebellar TDCS has an excitatory effect, and this increases the output of Purkinje G cells. And Purkinje G cell is the main, um, it's an inhibitory neuron and it's the sole output of the cerebellum. So this um, increase in output of the Purkinje G cells can actually increase the inhibition of the facilitatory pathway from the cerebellar nucleus to the cerebellar cortex. So essentially what this means that if you do anodal cerebellar TDCS, it could lead to an increase of inhibitory control from the cerebellum to the cortex. And cathodal TDCS has the opposite effect. So it basically leads to a disinhibition of the cerebellar cortex by reducing, uh, cerebral cortex by reducing the Purkinje G cell um, inhibition. Um, and so this is actually the opposite of what you see when you do TDCS on the cortex. So usually when you do TDCS on the cortex, anodal leads to facilitation and cathodal leads to inhibition. Now, things are not as straightforward as this. Uh, the effects of cerebellar um, TDCS are not always polarity specific. What I mean by that is, Anodal does not always um, lead to inhibition, and cathodal does not always lead to excitation. And part of the reason is because the microcircuitry of the cerebellum is very, very complex. And so if you look at the image, um, the one on the left side, you can see um, this is basically a um, cell of the cerebellum with all the three layers. And the cerebellum has both excitatory neurons as well as inhibitory neurons. So uh, Purkin G cell, the Golgi cells, the stellate, and the basket cells are usually the inhibitory neurons, and the granule cells are actually the excitatory neuron. So as you can see from this figure, uh, the neurons of the cerebellum are not identically oriented, and they even, they actually follow a very complex anatomical distribution throughout the cerebellum. And so this will cause a hyperpolarization in some, co some compartments of the cerebellar cortex, while others will depolarize at the same time. So because of this, uh, the polar there's no polarity-specific effect. Sometimes anodal can lead to facilitation, and sometimes it can lead to inhibition. So uh, this becomes um, sort of complicated when we are trying to find out about uh, the role of uh, cerebellar TDCS in cognitive function. Um, so a lot of, starting in the early, um, I think 2010, a lot of researchers have, um, you know, done studies using cerebellar TDCS in healthy controls and trying to find out the cognitive and language effect. And what they found is that cerebellar TDCS, uh, both anodal and cathodal, can lead to beneficial cognitive effects. For example, Pope and Miel did a word generation study um, using cathodal 
anodal and sham TDCS to the cerebellum, and they found that cathodal TDCS facilitated verb generation, whereas um, sham and anode uh, did not have any beneficial effect. Um, similarly, Ferrucci uh, did a study um, on implicit learning, and they found that anodal stimulation increased implicit learning, uh, facilitated implicit learning as opposed to sham or cathode. So obviously both anodal and cathodal um, leads to beneficial cognitive effect and healthy controls. So the ability to of cerebellar TDCS to modify behavior and healthy subjects, it makes it an interesting approach with a potential therapeutic role for participants with aphasia. So Given this background, I want to actually talk to you a little bit about our study. So our main research question was to determine if right cerebellum coupled with language therapy improves language performance in individuals with chronic aphasia with large lesions. So we're going to focus on two different behavioral tasks today. So we're going to look at data from spelling treatment as well as naming treatment. And given that uh, studies and healthy controls have shown beneficial effect for both anodal and cathodal. We're going to, um, our hypothesis was that anodal or cathodal TDCS plus language therapy would result in improved language performance compared to sham plus language therapy. Now I want to talk to you briefly about the study design. So I do want to mention that several aspects of this study is very similar to the Cates trial as well as the SLICE trial. But one important aspect, the main key difference is that this is a within-subject crossover trial in which participants will receive TDCS intervention as well as sham intervention in a crossover fashion. So once um, the participants are enrolled, they will be randomly assigned to a cathode group or an anode group, and then they will ra be randomly assigned to receive sham therapy or TDCS therapy. Um, so, and then they will receive therapy for 15 treatment sessions, and it can be uh, anywhere from three to five sessions per week, so it will probably take about five weeks to finish, and then they get, so they get detailed testing before they start treatment and after they finish treatment. And then there's a two-month washout phase where they don't receive any therapy, and then they come back after two months, and then they receive the crossover part of the study. So if they initially receive TDCS, then they, they will get CHAM, and then they will get 15 treatment sessions, and then we do post-treatment testing, and then um, they'll get a break for two months, and they come back after two months for the follow-up testing. So this is a completely double-blind study. Uh, the clinician as well as the patient will not know what condition they're assigned to. So using this design, we uh, have two different behavioral treatments. So we looked at uh, performance of spelling therapy plus TDCS as well as uh, performance of naming um, treatment plus TDCS, of course, in two different groups of participants. Um, so in general, so this is the main electrode montage. So once participants come, they will get assigned to group cathode or anode. So in group anode, the anode will be placed um, on the right cerebellum. That's the posterior part of the right cerebellum, which is the main language and cognitive region. And then the cathode or the reference is going to be placed on the right shoulder. And so this is going to be reversed for group cathode. So in group cathode, the cathode will be placed on the right cerebellum and then the anode on the shoulder. And um, so we used a constant current simulator, uh, which is the active out dose 2, which is, I think, uh, similar to what we use for the SLICE trial here. And so they received 2 milliampere of current for 20 minutes. And this is consistent with all the studies that have used cerebellar TBCS. OK, so before uh, we, I talk about data, I want to actually show you some modeling um, results of um, the current flow in the cerebellum. So it's important to know where the current is going. And you hope that it's actually going to the cerebellum, but you know, if you do modeling, so you can figure out where else is it going, and that might help you interpret the results of your study. So um, 
So we completed a modeling study on using one high resolution um, T1 image of a healthy control. And so based on this, so we use the same montage as we use in our participants. So as you can see here, uh, the maximum electric field amplitude was generated in the right cerebellum. There was very little spread to the left cerebellum, but no spread to the left hemisphere left cortex or to the right cortex. So basically pretty much all of the current that's generated is, you know, within um, the cerebellum, within the right cerebellum. Okay, so now I'm going to start with our first um, treatment study, which is um, looking at the effects of uh, behavioral spelling uh, treatment and um, TDCS. Um, so this is a case study. So. So this is a 57-year-old man um, who's right-handed um, with bilateral um, MC infarct due to carotid dissection. So he had his first stroke in 2000 um, to the left MCA territory, um, resulting in aphasia and hemiparesis. And um, he underwent intensive inpatient and outpatient rehabilitation, and he had improved um, to a large extent. And then he was driving and, you know, I think working part-time as well. And then he had another stroke, his second stroke in 2010 to the right hemisphere, and that resulted in him becoming mute due to severe anarthria. And he ended up getting a PEC tube and, um, you know, severe hemiparesis. So he underwent intensive rehab uh, for, I think, two years, but he did not recover at all um, in terms of his speech. You know, he, he was still mute, uh, but his comprehension had recovered to a functional level. So his main um, communication modality was um, writing. So this is actually his um, scan. Um, if you look at it, you know, he sees um, two bilateral strokes, one on the left and the other one on the right. So um, as I mentioned before, the participant is mute and communicates by writing. Um, and augmented with a variety of gestures. So he was very frustrated because, you know, right, he could only write and he had like major spelling deficits. Um, so he's very frustrated and he wanted us to help him, um, you know, to get better at his spelling. So he was enrolled in this treatment study five years after his second stroke. So he had a second stroke in 2010 and we enrolled him in the study in 2015. And um, his narrative writing uh, typically consisted of simple sentence with a lot of errors. And majority of his errors were phonologically implausible non-word errors. He made some semantic errors as well as some um, letter omissions. Because he depended on writing to communicate, recognizable spelling is critical for effective social communication. So, for the treatment, um, we actually employed a spelling um, treatment protocol that Kiwana and RG had developed previously and had used in several stroke as well as PPA studies. So before we started treatment, uh, we administered the Johns Hopkins dysgraphia battery. So this was to get an uh, in-depth um, understanding of his spelling deficits. And so based on the dysgraphia battery, uh, we selected 80 words that the participants misspelled, and the 80 words were divided into two different sets. Uh, 40 items were trained words. They were practiced during TDCS, that's during sham as well as um, TDCS. And there were another 40 words, that's the untrained words, and that was only tested prior to the start of treatment, end of treatment, and two months post-treatment. And all the words um, in both the sets were matched for lexical frequency, <coughs> letter length, and concreteness. And words were four to eight letters long, and they consisted of nouns, verbs, and adjectives. <coughs> so <coughs> the participant received 15 sessions of TDCS treatment and 15 sessions of sham treatment. <coughs> So the behavioral treatment session was about 45 minutes long, and he received TDCS during the first 20 minutes. 
So he was randomized to the anode group. So he received anodal TDCS to the right cerebellum. So he first got sham for 15 sessions. So did pre-treatment, before the treatment, uh, pre-treatment testing, and then after sham plus behavioral therapy, we did post-treatment testing. And then he had a break for two months, and then he came back to us again. We did testing, and then started TDCS plus behavioral therapy. So uh, we had three main outcome measures uh, for this uh, part of the study. So first was a performance on trained items, so that's trained spelling to dictation. Then we, had we looked at performance on untrained items. And then we also looked at performance on an untrained task, which was the written picture naming, um, which is the Philadelphia. We looked at performance on written Philadelphia naming test. The reason we looked at a Philadelphia naming test was because this was part of um, another, the other study, the naming study, that uh, we used this as the untrained, untrained task. So what we did is we compared correct responses before and after treatment for each condition. So for TDCS, we looked at performance before TDCS and after TDCS, and for similarly for sham, and we used the McNemer's uh, test for correlated response to look at if there was any significant difference. So I'm going to show you uh, the treatment data. So if you look at this, uh, the Basically, this is the absolute percent change in scores from baseline. So if you look at it, so he started with zero. So he had zero percent accuracy baseline. And so he made significant gains with sham, uh, indicated in blue. But um, for both immediately post-treatment and two months uh, post-completion uh, of treatment, but he made a lot more gains with TDCS. So if you can see, especially at two months post uh, fall, post treatment completion, his uh, change uh, percent change was about 35 percent for uh, sham, whereas he was at 98 percent for um, TDCS. We actually compared uh, the performance on TDCS and SHAM directly, the improvement in performance, and uh, through a chi-score, and we found that there was a significant and greater improvement with TDCS as opposed to SHAM. Uh, for trained uh, spelling to dictation immediately post-treatment and two months follow-up. Now for um, the untrained spelling to uh, dictation tasks, uh, the results are very similar to the trained spelling to dictation task, except that the difference, there's more effect um, of TDCS um, as opposed to sham, in that, you know, the difference, the percent change is a lot more during TDCS as opposed to sham. And as again, uh, we did a chi-square to directly compare uh, the difference between TDCS and sham, and we found that there was a significant improvement uh, with TDCS as to sham of both immediately post-treatment as well as at two months follow-up. Now, the, the most interesting um, finding was the performance on written picture naming. So he actually did not improve at all on written picture naming during the sham condition. It was basically zero. There was no improvement. Whereas he showed really good improvement, about 14% immediately post up TDCS, as well as two months of follow-up data, and whereas there was no, um, nothing during the sham condition. So he not only generalized from untrained um, item to untrained, so from trained item to untrained, but he also generalized from um, trained item to untrained task. So uh, we also collected some rest resting state uh, data for this uh, participant uh, before and after treatment. So we did not have funds to do a uh, resting state before and after each condition. That's TDCS and SHAM. So what we did is we collected resting state data before we started treatment and then after the completion of, immediately after the completion of treatment. So um, I'm going to show you, uh, so that this figure is actually of the Fisher transformed correlation matrix for the resting state data before we started treatment. So we only looked at non-lesion tissue. So if there's any um, area that, 
um, that was damaged, that ROS actually was not included in the resting state analysis. So what you see uh, basically are the regions um, that were not affected by stroke. So it starts with severe frontal gyrus, prefrontal cortex, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, temporal pole, inferior temporal gyrus, fusiform, and the left and the right cerebellum. So what you see here is actually the z-scores uh, from the correlation matrix. And you see that it's the before we started treatment, uh, he actually, this participant, had very weak um, z-scores uh, connectivity between the right, uh, this is the right cerebellum, between the right cerebellum and um, the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere, and also between right hemisphere and the left hemisphere regions of interest. And we um, repeated uh, connect, um, resting state um, host treatment. So what you see is uh, the one at the bottom is uh, the resting state data after the completion of treatment. And you see that there's actually an improvement um, in connectivity. So initially, the z-scores were um, less than zero, many of it was less than 0.2, which is basically indicated by dark blue. And post-treatment, it's actually increased to 1, 1.2, and in some instances, like 1.3. So we actually did a direct um, comparison between post-treatment minus pretreatment um, resting state connectivity. And you see that there's a dramatic improvement in connectivity between uh, the right cerebellum and the left hemisphere, um, residual tissue in the left hemisphere and residual tissue in the right hemisphere, as well as increase in connectivity between the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. Of course, you know, um, this was, we don't know if this change in connectivity was because of TDCS per se, because we did not do it, you know, after sham and after TDCS. So it could be, you know, the writing therapy helped, or it could, or it could be a combination of uh, both. But we think it could, this change could be attributed due to TDCS because we looked at several normal controls we, as a part of our longitudinal recovery project. Uh, we scanned them at multiple intervals, and we looked at several normal controls, and we saw that they did not have any change in connectivity uh, between, um, you know, the same, at the same time point that we um, scanned our patient. But uh, obviously, we can't say with certainty because, you know, we did not um, collect data after SHAM and after TDCS. But um, so now. This, um, so in summary, what this case study shows is that anodal TDCS, anodal cerebellar TDCS plus behavioral spelling therapy is more effective than behavioral therapy alone in improving uh, spelling to dictation. And we found generalization uh, from trained item to written picture naming was only facilitated with TDCS but not sham. And the resting state connectivity data indicates improvement in spelling. Um, net spelling is accompanied by an improvement in the cerebro-cerebellar network connectivity. And we all know that the cerebellum is a critical region involved in skill learning. And repeated TDCS plus behavioral therapy might have facilitated the learning of writing skills and or compensatory strategies. Of course, um, one thing to keep in mind is that, you know, he received a both TDCS and SHAM with this study. So it's, and he actually received a SHAM first followed by TDCS. So it's possible that uh, the improvement during TDCS might be uh, because he had the second treatment, you know. So he had 15 sessions with SHAM and then he's getting the same treatment during TDCS. So, the improvement might just be because he was getting a lot more treatment, you know, because he received TBCS a second time. And um, this would have, you know, given him time for a consolidation of effects. Um, so, of course, you know, we need to um, do this in many more participants with, you know, maybe TBCS first and Sham, you know, in a counterbalanced order to determine if if TDCS actually resulted in improvement or if it was actually that he was just getting more therapy. So now I'm going to switch 
to a different behavioral treatment task, which is naming, and I'm going to show you some data from that. So um, we um, had enrolled six participants with aphasia for the naming treatment and plus DBCS, and all participants had very large uh, chronic stroke um, in the MCA territory involving the left uh, temporal, uh, frontal, and or parietal. And all participants had moderate or moderate to severe aphasia and naming deficits. And the mean age was 63 years, and they were about three years post-onset. All participants were right-handed, and they had at least high school education. So just as um, the study design, so three participants were randomly assigned to group cathode, and three were randomly assigned to anode, and then they received the crossover um, trial. And so this uh, naming treatment is um, similar to what is used Kate's trial as well as the SLICE trial, and I'm sure all of you, I know, you're very familiar with this um, design. So I'm not going to get you know, into details about this. So it's basically training audiovisual speech perception to improve naming. Um, and the treatment is about 45 minutes in length, and TDCS was administered for the first 20 minutes. So the participants will come, get 15 sessions, then two months break, and then they come back get for the next 15 sessions. So uh, for this study, we had uh, two main outcome variables, so trained performance and trained items, the items that they were getting trained during the treatment, and performance on untrained item, which is the Philadelphia naming test. So, uh, compared to, uh, similar to the spelling treatment, we looked at correct responses before and after treatment for TDCS and SHAM using the McNamara's test for correlated responses. Uh, so this is the results of group anode. So if, for the trained items, so three participants were um, there in this group. So if you look at this, participant one showed, you know, had some gains. Uh, for trained items during um, sham, but it was not significant, but he made about 38% um, change um, during the TDCS um, condition. Uh, participant two uh, actually did not have any change uh, from baseline, uh, both during sham and TDCS. And participant three uh, showed some, like about 10% change doing both of uh, TDCS and SHAM. Now, what is interesting is if you look at um, performance on untrained items, uh, participant one and two basically did not show any change in un untrained items uh, during SHAM. And participant three showed very uh, slight improvement, about 5% um, change, but it was not significant, where, whereas all three participants actually showed significant um, improvement um, on the untrained items um, during TBCS. Now, this is the result for group cathode. So if you look at group cathode, uh, for performance on sham for the trained items, so um, all the three participants showed um, you know, some improvement, like Participant four had pretty like about 25% um, in, um, change from baseline during sham, and participant uh, five had about 10. So did participant six. Um, the effect was obviously a lot more um, during TDCS as um, for all for two participants, participant four and participant six. Participant 5, the, the effects were comparable during TDCS and SHAM. Um, what's interesting is what happened during untrained items. So um, P4 and P6 um, showed significant generalization from trained to untrained items, uh, whereas during, during TDCS, whereas during SHAM, P4 did show some improvement, but it was not statistically um, significant. It was about like 8% change. Whereas P5, um, his scores actually went down from baseline during um, sham. And P6 showed like 2% change in sham. So in general, so for sham, 
four out of six participants showed significant effect uh, for trained items, um, whereas no participant generalized from trained item to untrained item during um, SHAM. Now with TDCS, five out of six participants showed significant effect for trained item, and five out of six participants generalized from trained item to untrained item um, only during TDCS. So, of course, you know, the results, um, you know, this is a very small uh, group, but um, the results are definitely um, interesting because they show um, generalization. And one thing that we actually didn't test was um, about their functional performance, you know, how they did on functional communication skills, because we noticed that all the six participants improved a lot on functional communication skills. You know, they were able to talk on the phone better, you know, say communicates their needs and wants better. So, but we didn't, we realized that after the fact, but that was something that was very striking, um, is that there was a dramatic difference in their functional communication skills post-TDCS. Um, so, to sort of sum up, uh, even though this is a preliminary data, the findings are very interesting and illustrate the therapeutic potential of right cerebellar TDCS to augment language therapy in aphasia. So we found no polarity specific effects, that is we found beneficial effects for both anodal and cathodal. And these results are very similar to the, what, uh, to the ones found in the literature on healthy controls. And the robust effect that we saw uh, during TDCS could be related to the duration and intensity of treatment. So they received 15 sessions of treatment and for 20 minutes of TDCS. So it's possible that this repeated um, intensive treatment could have um, led to um, you know, increased benefits. Alternatively, long-term stimulation might have um, induced long-term potentiation of neurons that may have lowered the threshold of neuronal excitability and subsequent modification of um, synaptic connectivity in the area applied. Of course, um, you know, we do have to do it in a lot more patients to see if these results actually hold good in a larger uh, patient group. Um, so another um, critical part is that cerebellum is involved in skill learning. So it's possible that repeated TDCS might have facilitated skill learning for naming and or, you know, compensatory strategies. So it's possible that the learning part um, might have improved, which probably would have resulted in improved uh, performance on trained and untrained items. And other studies in normal controls have shown um, facilitation of skill learning after cerebellar TDCS, uh, both anodal and cathodal. And um, so targeting the intact cerebellum allows the possibility of identifying a single target that can be used across people with aphasia with varying sites and size in the left hemisphere lesion. So you could, because usually the cerebellum is intact in patients who have, you know, stroke in the left hemisphere, um, you could, you know, you could use this, anyone with potentially a left hemisphere stroke, you could try to target the right cerebellum and see if you have beneficial effects for language um, therapy. Um, of course, you know, um, this is, as I said before, it's preliminary data, we're collecting data, so um, one of the things that we want to do, you know, as we're collecting more data now is to look at change in functional communication skills because uh, we noticed that with uh, the participants who were involved in this pilot project, we saw big change in their functional communication skills. So now we're actually tracking their change in functional communication skills, you know, before treatment, after treatment, and at two months uh, post-treatment. So because we didn't have funding for the pilot uh, study, we could not get uh, detailed structural imaging um, and um, DTI. So I think it's very important to figure out, um, you know, to get more structural imaging to determine which cortical regions are intact and which are actually lesion. And so uh, the success of this uh, cerebellar TDCS actually might depend on a certain cortical areas being intact. So it's 
it's really important to do more detailed work. Also, we found similar effects uh, for both anodal and cathodal TDCs. So we're planning to do resting state imaging to determine uh, the polarity specific uh, changes in brain network dynamics um, induced by cerebellar TDCs. And this um, might help us provide a plausible mechanistic account um, of neuroplasticity and explain the behavioral changes that are modulated by cerebellar TDCs in aphasia. So uh, with this, I would like to thank all my participants, uh, my fabulous K99 mentoring team, and everyone from the SCORE lab, um, people from Hopkins and uh, the Neurology Internal Review Committee, and also Julius, um, Chris, and Taylor. I mean, they've been super helpful in sending me the device and um, you know the treatment program and always help me troubleshoot all issues. And also uh, Marom and Adoni for doing the computational modeling study. And uh, a donation from a patient helped us actually get all the pilot data. Uh, well, thank you and uh, be happy to answer any questions if you have. Um, why don't you go ahead and answer any questions you have from your room first, Raj, and then we can open it up here. I guess everyone has listened to this talk a couple of times <laughs> and everyone's sitting here. <laughs> so uh, I'm not sure if they will have any questions. Um, uh, no. Did you expect increased connectivity uh, between the cerebellum and the cortex if a lot of the activation of the Purkinje cells is uh, So the question was, did I expect an increase in connectivity between uh, the cerebellum and the cerebral, cerebral, uh, cerebellar cortex if the activation, since the activation of the Purkinje cells are inhibitory? Actually, I just realized you did animal for the one that you right. asked yeah. So do you expect to find similar results in the patients? Get yes, because uh, you know it sort of reduces the inhibition of Purkinje in cells with cathodal. Anodal increases, but it's uh, not just Purkinje cells. You know, the granule cells could also be involved. I mean, I understand that the Purkinje is the sole uh, output of the cerebellum, but there are excitatory uh, neurons as well. So it's possible that they are influencing the action of the Purkinje cells. So, but I don't know. I mean, uh, we are, hopefully by the end of five years, I'll have a better idea about, um, you know, the polarity specific changes. Um, I think that's all the questions. Um, so there's some from, from the chat I'm seeing, if you want to address those next. Do you see the chat? Yes, I do. Yes, yes. Um, well, we actually did not. Uh, oh, sorry. Did you find it challenging to bring down the impedance of electrodes targeting the cerebellum? We have sometimes found it harder to bring down the impedance for electrodes over inferior occipital cortex, likely due to the structures of the cranium. Um, actually, no, we did not find any. Um, you know, challenge at all. And in fact, our uh, colleagues um, in uh, PMNR department are doing high def uh, TDCS on the right cerebellum, and they actually are able to monitor um, impedance as they're you know um, met, you know doing TDCS. And they have also never told us any difficulty at all. Um, but I'll keep you know that is definitely a good point, and maybe we should keep that in mind. Um, but we did not. Um, did you have any tests of general motor skills rather than um, spe language specific naming and writing? Um, no, we did not do any tests of general motor skills, um, unfortunately. Yeah, we did not. Um, but we, they were all 
Um, two participants had uh, no motor deficits at all, uh, and the rest, five participants, had motor deficits. Yeah. Well, does that answer your uh, the questions, or do you need more clarification? I'm not sure. I don't know if they can hear me. We've got a question from in here, or, oh no, there's one okay. question I think on the chat, if you scroll up, there's one from MUS. Yeah. Oh, um, so um, we were only measuring, uh, so the question is, sorry, <laughs> have you been able to determine how long the effects last past the two-month point? Unfortunately, no. We didn't do any formal testing, but the patient's spouse, they actually call and text me and sort of, you know, they keep in touch and update me. And so most of them have been able to uh, maintain informally the gains that, you know. Uh, so everyone finished uh, the treatment end of last year with the exception of, I think, two. And we, you know, his, um, I spoke to most of their spouse, you know, um, I think sometime in the fall once I got my grant to update them and they said that, you know, they've been doing really well. But we do plan to, at some point, um, maybe, you know, do a six-month follow-up. Yes? And how is the washout period? So, so, right, so the question that. was, yeah. what was the washout uh, period determined? So we determined the washout period based on um, studies that RG and QAN are doing here on PPA. Um, so they, and a few other studies that are, you know, people do crossover trials. So two months is uh, sort of a standard washout phase that a lot of studies uh, are doing, which, you know, and that's why we went with the two-month um, two washout period. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Oh, sure. Um, RG wants to add something. Do you? One of the patients. No. Oh, okay. Yeah. So Arjun is going to add something. So one of the patients, the patient who made the least improvement in her study, um, who really didn't show him, the one who didn't show much improvement at all, it has continued to improve. Um, and she did show improvement in connected speech, um, and mm -hmm. even though she didn't on the naming, but now her naming has improved further. So she, you know, I don't know if that facilitated sort of starting to improve once she started to talk more. She she um, is starting to name more, and um, so I think it's very impressive. What which was this? Um, your P two. Oh, okay. P2. Oh yes, yeah. yes. I know. right. Okay. The, okay, so um, was the the question is was the person who scored the outcome measures blinded to the treatment phase? Yes. So RG was the only person who knew what the person was, what condition the uh, the patient was getting. I was blinded, uh, unblinded actually for a very long time. I had to uh, unblinded for my grant submission. That was like way after the treatment was over and the scoring was over. Yeah. So, All right. I think that appears to be it. Um, All I right. <laughs> Thanks, Raj. Um, we've got, Thank you. I think our next talk will be on January 19th with Dr. Greg Hickok. So we have a little break, um, but we will send out a link to that on probably the week before January 19th, so be on the lookout for that. Um, thanks very much for presenting. It was great. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.